The CPU, or rather microprocessor, is the heart of any computer system. This is what it looks like from the outside, but have you ever wondered what it looks like from the inside? Every processor consists of billions of transistors, comparable in size to a DNA molecule. And this is absolutely real. Processors are in all gadgets. They work for us every day, including now while you watch this video. But have you ever wondered how they actually function? Anyway, how did people get a piece of silicon to do the calculations for them? Today we will analyze the main elements of a processor, see how it all works, what they do, and why they are needed. And we will also look at the latest 10th generation Intel driving the Acer Swift 7 laptop. This is Droider, let's get started. Well, first of all, the model of our processor is the i7-1065G7. It is a quad core and the cores are very clearly visible in this video. Each processor core contains all the necessary elements to perform calculations. The more cores there are, the more parallel computations the processor can perform. This is useful for multitasking and some resource intensive tasks like 3D rendering. For example, we can simultaneously run 4K videos and see how the load is distributed in the cores, but wait. We're a little ahead of ourselves. Let's figure out how a core actually works. In essence, the core is a huge data transformation factory. At the input, we get one sort of data, while at the output, we get the processed one. There are a lot of transistors inside. These are miniature switches that can be in two states, to pass current or not pass current. These states are interpreted as zeros and ones, so the computer works in binary code. By the way, I think we need to analyze the binary logic and how it is implemented in processors as a separate topic. So, write if you'd like to watch it. On the face of it, what can we do with such a simple switch, you may ask. In fact, tons of things. If you correctly connect several transistors to each other, you get so-called logic gates. As a result, we would get a sort of if-then function, much like in Excel. If both wires have current running through them at the input, then it will be running at the output too, or not. Or one wire will have it while the other will not. It depends on what function you have. But then these gates can be combined into more complex circuits and enable the processor to do other operations like add, multiply, compare, and so on. Therefore, the processor core consists of many complex blocks, each of them doing something different. These are like different workshops in a factory. We only need to supply the raw materials, then they are distributed to the machines, and we get the result. I bet now you're saying, stop, Boris, but how will the processor understand what exactly it should do with the data? And that's a great question. To do this, apart from the data, we need to load instructions into the processor. Instructions are commands that say, it needs to be added, it needs to be multiplied, it needs to be moved somewhere, and so on. In general, there are a lot of instructions instructions, and they are different for each type of processor. For example, mobile chips use a shorter and simpler set. In personal computers, instructions are more complicated, and that is why apps for mobile phones do not run on laptops and vice versa. They simply don't understand each other's instructions. But to get the result from the processor, it's not enough to just say, here you are, the data, the instructions, do it. You need to tell the processor where to get the information from and where to put it. And here we turn to memory. To execute a command, the processor core needs to get two addresses in the memory. Where to get it, where to put it. And in fact, all the information, data, instructions, addresses are stored in the RAM. RAM is very fast, but modern processors are much faster. Therefore, in order to reduce downtime, modern processors always have faster cache memory. Here it is drawn in green in the photo. As a rule, they put a cache of three levels, sometimes four, the fastest being the first level. It is called L1, and it is usually several tens of kilobytes. Then comes L2 cache. It can be half a megabyte, and the L3 cache can reach several megabytes in size. The rule here is simple. The more cache, the less often the processor accesses the RAM, and therefore the downtime is minimal. Our processor has as many as 8 megabytes of cache, which isn't bad at all. I think everything is clear here. Moving on. Clock speed or clock rate. If the processor got the data randomly, it would easily get confused. Therefore, each processor has its own conductor, which is called a clock generator. Operations are performed on its command. It delivers an electrical pulse at a certain frequency, which is called the clock speed or rate. And as you can see, the higher the clock rate, the faster the processor runs. By the way, a real quartz crystal is installed in every processor, just like in a wristwatch where it serves to read seconds, and here for clock frequency. Usually, the crystal frequency is about 100 megahertz, but modern processes work faster, so the signal from the crystal passes through a number of multipliers. But the important thing is this. Now the processor is able to vary the frequency depending on the complexity of the task. For example, now we are not doing anything on the computer, and so the processor is running at a frequency of 1.3 gigahertz. This is called the base frequency. But let's for example unpack this archive and we see that the frequency immediately increases. The processor
processor goes into turbo mode and can reach as much as 3.9 gigahertz. This approach saves energy and prevents the processor from heating up too often. Another interesting technology in Intel processors is hyperthreading, which is used to distribute tasks. Each core is divided into two logical ones, and we get eight independent data streams that can simultaneously process information. By the way, what's especially cool about the latest Intel processors is that it's the neural network that regulates the frequency. This allows to keep the turbo mode longer with the same power consumption. Another cool thing that optimizes the work of the processor is the transition prediction. This is cool. It's a special algorithm that tries to predict an instruction before actually getting it, like an oracle right inside the processor. On the one hand, such a tool speeds up the core many times over, but on the other hand, as you see, an error would cost the computer a lot, so engineers are constantly optimizing it. But okay, enough of this. Let's go on. All of the core's components and the way they interact in between is actually called the microarchitecture. The better the microarchitecture is designed, the more instructions are processed with a certain amount of time, and this parameter is called the IPC. This means that if two processors have the same clock speed, it does not guarantee that they have equal performance. The one with the higher IPC will win. Interestingly, the new Intel Ice Lake generation, which we are looking at today, uses a new architecture which was updated for the first time since 2015. It's called Sunny Cove. The IPC of the new architecture is as much as 18% higher than that of the previous one. Therefore, pay attention to the generation of the processor when choosing a laptop. And now, let's raise our imaginary microscope drone to an even higher level. We see the so-called a system on a chip. Modern processors are not only central processor units, but there are many different modules built into a common system. First, the graphics processing unit. This is really interesting. Look again in our map of the new Intel. It is the GPU which occupies the most space here. It's arranged in the same way as the central processor. It also has cores, a cache, and also executes instructions. But unlike the central processor, it is mainly focused on one task, creating pixels on the screen. Therefore, graphics cores are much simpler. They are not even called cores, but executives blocks. The more blocks, the cooler. The 10th generation Intel has different types of graphics, from G1 to G7. We have a G7, as you can see by the name, and there are from 32 to 64 executive blocks. In the previous generation, the maximum number of blocks was only 24, so it is correct to call it processor graphics and not integrated graphics as before. Also, the RAM speed is very important for graphics, and that is why the new generation of Intel supports DDR4 3200 MHz and LP DDR4 with a frequency of 3 3733 megahertz. Well, since the laptop we are testing today has top-notch graphics, let's check it out. On the screen, you can see the FPS in Counter-Strike Go. Hit the like button if Counter-Strike is what you're into. What is especially convenient is that Intel now has the gameplay.intel.com website, where you can find the optimal settings for most games according to your processor model. And in general, most games can be comfortably played in full HD right with the built-in graphics. And to top it all, the icing on the cake is the Thunderbolt interface. The interface controller is located directly on the chip, right here. This solution allows not only to save space on the motherboard, but also significantly reduce delays, which is especially important. Let's check it out in practice. We are going to connect an external video card and a monitor via Thunderbolt and run the same games. What we see is the laptop performance level is now comparable to a powerful gaming PC. Compare the FPS with the built-in graphics on the left with an external video card on the right. Feel the difference. But the use of Thunderbolt is not reduced to this life hack. For example, we can connect an SSD drive to a monitor and a monitor to a laptop. And using just one hub on the laptop, we get a powerful computer for games, video editing, and other resource-intensive tasks. Let's run the Crystal Mark test. Check out the results on the screen. Moreover, with the same wire, we can connect a video card, SSD, and a monitor. In general, Thunderbolt is a great thing. I hope today we have helped you to understand how modern processes actually work and what they have inside. It was a rather complicated video, but I hope we succeeded. Thanks for watching. Using the link in the description, you can go to the CityLink website and order the laptop, which we tested today. Thanks to Intel for the help in preparing this video and the beautiful pictures. Write in the comments if you like such videos. Thanks for watching. This is Droider. See you.